Hello, this is Brian Foster on Kardak Radio, presenting the program Spiritism and the Spirit World Around Us. Hello on Sunday afternoon, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock Pacific, all time zones in between and around the world. We have a very exciting uh, talk again tonight, and that is we're further exploring high, higher education, education in the higher levels of heaven. This is a, a, uh, a little peek of what's, what you're going to be, what you're going to do, what you're going to learn when you're in the spirit world and you rise from the lower zone, from the dark abyss, you get into the lower levels of heaven. We had those talks before. And by the way, all of our, Facebook uh, live streaming and radio programs. They, you can see those, uh, the radio programs, you can see those on Kardec Radio, the website Kardec Radio. You can also go to the um, the Kardec Radio on your, you, we're 24 hours a day on Kardec Radio on your Android or your Apple device. We also have NW Spiritism, a YouTube channel. If you go to NW Spiritism, You'll see a YouTube channel. You can go on there. We will have all the Facebook talks uh, recorded and put on that site so you can watch them later. I also have other other videos on that site. I have many videos on that site from past talks, too, so you can explore the uh, NW Spiritism YouTube site also. So tonight, first, we always start with we are spiritists, right? This is Brian Foster of NW Spiritism. And what do we follow? We follow Alan Kardec, the Spirits book. And you can, again, you can get this on the EDI, CEI website. You can go to my website also, uh, nwspiritism.com. You can click on the picture of Alan Kardec. He's right up on the, the top right. And it will take you right to the book site. And you can find all of his books, Chico Xavier's book, Yvonne Piera, uh, others, uh, books in English uh, for Spiritism. You can also find them, of course, on Amazon.com. And, of course, Alan Kardec's books. You, if you look up Alan Kardec uh, and then put a space PDF, you'll find all his books on PDF. So tonight, let's get to it. This is exciting. So we had our first talk on the higher levels of heaven, what education was like. And now we're going to go more. And we talked about the organization and how things play out, right? For each level of heaven, there is there's little feeder colleges, and then they go feeder schools. They go into the there's the main city on each level, and then you go to that that college, and then when you graduate, you go to the next level. Now, of course, as I said before, no one is forced to go to school. You can park yourself as long as you want. You have free will. But now let's talk about what is in the higher levels of heaven, what do you learn? Well, children go to school in heaven, just like on earth, but what they learn practically leaps out on us like a page in a fantasy novel. They learn to create, adults and children, learn to create with their minds. And they are taught and they practice how to control their thoughts in concert with others to not only create objects, but living creatures. And in this, in January 1920, the spirit Arnell told the Reverend G. Val Owen about what he witnessed while well, at a type of a mixed high school, a liberal range of ages for children, you know, maybe from 12 to 18, and in, in their appearance of age, not in their spiritual, their you know, actual age of their immortality. But these these children in this level, because they have a, uh, a natural bent towards this, they have a, a gift, and they have been kept his children to let them restart their lives and then, and then to raise them to help them in for their next life. So Arnell describes a, an oblong lecture hall with large front doors and windows open to the gardens outside. Birds fly in and out of the hall and the small birds land on chairs and even land on the students to rest a while. So it's a very, you know, wonderful, pleasant uh, environment. And then there was this large bird that flew in the hall and perched himself on the arch beam on the rafters, right up on the top, right? 
And he looked down upon the crowd as if he was unable to decipher what all those children were doing. His eyes darted back and forth. Sometimes they were looking at the students, other times following the flight of the little birds. And seeing the action, the teacher gave off a challenge to the students. And this is what they said. Oh, hello. Oh, there's Mara's on and Rosalind's on. Thank you very much for being on. So seeing the action, of course, and then, of course, these, these professors, the teachers at school, they're, you know, they're very dynamic, right? And then they're very, they're very much like a Socratic dialogue where they see things and they talk things out. And they look at everything they can to be a, a lesson. So the teacher gave a challenge to the students. They had to entice the large bird down from the, from the ceiling, but it had to be done without force, without utilizing their minds to will the bird to descend. It had to do so willingly. So th the professor told the other students to leave with her. She wanted the younger students to figure out how to do this. She and the elder students left to the gardens and the remaining students stayed put looking puzzled. But Arnell, who I later learned really was like the director of the schools, but he stayed to watch. He wanted to watch, you know, how were they going to do this? How were they going to, how were they going to figure this out without willing, right? Because in the power of their minds, they could have said, you know, bird come down and would have come down. Now, this is what he said. He described what occurred in the lecture hall. He goes, now there are methods of process more than one by which these things may be done. It is not my purpose now to tell these to you, but only how these young pupils did their task. You must keep in mind that their studies were at this time in principle directed into the sphere of the creative faculty. And also that they were still in the initial stage of that development of science. To one more advanced, a problem would never have presented no difficulty whatsoever. But these boisterous young students were for the moment at stand because of the qualification inset into the problem by, by their professor. This was that their will should be used creatively this, that was the ruse, and that alone, for it had been easy for them to will the descent of that bird and claim his obedience. But that would have not concerted with the quality of the creation. So, so what is he telling us? He's telling us that the, form, the formulation of the problem presented to the students displays the phil philosophical cornerstone of God and his high creative lords, down to the angels who help us in our daily life. The central theme is always one of protecting free will, not just free will for humans, but also for any creation, whereby the programming of that object should be able to follow its instinct and intellect without constant direct interference. That which is conjured or evolved alive must not be a robot awaiting explicit instructions for every moment. An autonomous living thing must, not be, must be able to not only make their own decisions, but also to improve along its own lines. The spirit realm is wholly dynamic. It's always changing and evolving, and every creature within is expected to perform the same. So these students, when they graduate at some distant future, may come to Earth and lead us onto our correct path. They will have learned to alter our direction suddenly, not the place in a resistible command in their head, but the place of desire, a treat in our path to lead us to the preferred bearing, all accomplished with maintaining our free will intact. It's like it's like subtly manipulating kindergartners, right? You put, you know, you put a candy in one spot because you want them to go over there it, and they don't even know they're being manipulated. That's a lot like us on earth because the high spirits look at us like an elementary school student. In fact, Emmanuel said at one time, he said, you can look at the earth as an elementary school or a mental institution. <laughs> so, because I mean, we're all in need of help. We're all trying to improve and we're trying to become civilized. So then Arnell describes the scene with the classmates in silent reflection. Then they were deep in thought. And then when suddenly one voice started, the others followed. And then one student proposed a solution. There was one of the girls that hit upon a method which came to be adopted, you know, after they talked much noisy discussion. The children made a circle of the couches, which had been placed in a regular fashion around the room. And remember, all this is in heaven. These are all spirits. And they all, and so this is, you know, think as I'm telling you this, this is, this is awaiting you, right? And I've already discussed, discussed one of my uh, earlier talks about G. Valen's mother and her and her group of friends were, you know, adult appearing spirits. When they tried to create something, they tried to create an elf, but nothing living at that point in time. But when they were like on one of the first levels of heaven, they were trying to create with their minds too. Now, this is a higher, this is, this is you know, with more technical difficulty. So then... They got themselves in order, 
and with the small children among them. And the first day, stage of the proceedings was to gather all the smaller birds within the circle. That was easy. And there was about like 60 smaller birds. They put them all in the circle. And then those birds began to group themselves together in the middle in response to the concentrated will of the pupils. So the students around there said, you know, got all the little birds that were in that room and said, okay, get in the circle. And when they were brought together in this way, there was much chirping and, and preening. They were moving around. But then they started to grow silent and still. They all stood there and they were went to sleep. And then what happened, Arnell noticed that their feathers slowly changed their nature, became a rather dull slate color, not unlovely, but kind of a neutral hint, popping off white. And they had withdrawn from each of its birds its aura. And this is now, I'll quote him right now. Not quite entirely, but leaving perhaps some eighth part thereof, which, however, was not visible without, but was distributed through the body of the bird within. So think of that. They took what would appear, if we were in heaven, we saw this bird, would appear like a complete natural life form. They put it in the middle and they, they subtracted seventh eighth of its life force. I'll go on with this quote. Then the children on the right, as they watched them from beneath the arcade, quietly and slowly left their stations, going over to the left of the room, took their stations behind those others who still reclined upon the lounges. A while, a luminous cloud gathered in front of them, and between them and the birds, there was the aura of all the birds composite and blended into one. It slowly contracted itself, and it lay upon the floor in the shape of an egg. Then it was gently raised upon its end. Its weight had become increased to its ratio. Then the shape was changed until there stood in its place a replica of the large bird who sat upon the arch aloft, very intent upon the strange doings in the process below him. So, okay, so what were they doing? They created, they took the aura from all the, like these around 60 birds, and they created one large egg. And then from that egg, they emerged a copy of what looked like the bird up in the rafter, the larger bird in the rafter. And when that bird there, it kind of stood still and silent, but soon there came like a, you know, it started moving its wings and and it, and they made it a female bird because the bird up in the rafter was a male bird. And then the bird walked a few times for the children and they, the children applied their wills in united action. And at least, you know, the bird stood there, it was, it was alive. And then the bird ran from one child to another. And then she, and then she started singing. You know, and then from from that, as soon as he started vocalizing, then the bird from aloft came down and joined the mate upon the floor. So what did we? What did Arnell just tell us? So spirits were creating life from other life. Is is it as if a small house composed of building blocks was presented to a child, and then a picture of a different home came into his or her view? The child would dismantle the original house and attempt to create a new house with the same material. That's how we all learn, right? We, we, we learn with building blocks. We don't, we don't invent out of thin air. We make, we reuse, we build upon that which was already present to make something new. It is the same with a person first learning how to program. They write a few simple lines of code, but in the main, they borrow from other routines. They reuse subroutines, modules, services to build a new logical construct, a new program. Same thing with cars, right? Cars are built in parts, right? They bring parts, they put parts together. They don't build it out of one little thing. So, but now this is, you know, amazing. You built life. So the children in the classroom utilize the auras of the smaller bird to make one larger bird. Now, what's an aura, right? To us on the earthly plane, it's like an atmosphere generated about a thing or a person. Like it's an invisible emanation. But it must be more than that to be manipulated and reused. It must contain the logical DNA within it. The full range of subroutines, interfaces, ethereal connections, and the logic of its very being. So the children were using a set of logic which was encapsulated with an energy field. They extracted the required logic from each of the smaller, smaller birds' auras and amassed one larger bird. It was like taking a Lego set that they had a, a Lego of a house. They took the Legos off and they built another house, a bigger house with three smaller Lego houses. 
And so when the spirit world refers to individual spirits, they often use the word personality. I'm sure a lot of people who've read spiritual letters seen personality. So as if our sum total of our being, our multiple lives, our character, our current state of ascension could be summed up in one word. But what if it can't? Think of the, the genesis of writing a movie, novel, or play, or even a video game. Because I'm trying to so think this is, you know, this is a whole different in the spirit world is you have to think of us as, as logical constructs that we are created, right? So let's look at the video game for a second. The central characters are supplied with a personality, right? A set of attitudes, capabilities, and character that provides the foundation of all subsequent actions and dialogue of that actor, that personality. The logic deriving from a specific personality must be adhered to. Otherwise, the character in the film or the video game would appear arbitrary and false. Therefore, we are, each of us, is a personality, a buildup of experiences that are on top of our moral character. And we are on earth to reform and reprogram the least desired portions of ourselves. We are freestanding logical constructs who have the ability to modify ourselves, hopefully for the better. And as we improve, we are allowed more range and more power. So think about that for a second. We really, we, we are, we are self -modif modifying automatons. We are in, intellects that we can rewire our brains and that's exactly why we're here we are here to re rewire to remove our blemishes and improve our character and this whole process is being exposed by the spirit arnell in this conversation with the reverend jiva owen so at the end of the experiment all the children were, were uh were just you know talking and yelling and they're all they're all excited but then arnell reported that the most difficult part of the trial was the construction of the throat so the female bird would sing the correct song using the right pitch to attract the male bird so remember what i said is we you know we learn by reusing so this this to me is a huge clue so the fact this fact he said the hardest part was the throat serves to reinforce the utilization of other auras. For the most unique area of the new constructions were the most difficult to build. The students can just lift the logic out of the auras of the small, smaller bird since nothing was similar to the throat of the larger bird. Therefore, that section had to be customized. The artificial female bird wasn't allowed to exist for long. The smaller bird, birds were not denied their full auras. And then Arnell tells us what happened next. But first, I want to go over that is the fact is that they program this larger bird from from the subroutines and programs that's you know, kind of to give you an analogy from the smaller ones. And then they had to they had to, some things that were completely unique. They had to create themselves by modifying other parts. So then how did they deconstruct? And now here's another clue. This is what Arnell tells us what happened next. There now remained for them to proceed with the reverse process by which the bird was again resolved into the original composite or a cloud, and thus again dispersed among its original owners. This was effected not by their concentrating their wills upon the bird itself, but upon the smaller bird standing there, unconscious. This is why they did not withdraw all the aura from them, or is one of the reasons why. Another was that it could not have been well with the birds if they were deprived of their auras in total. It was therefore upon that remnant left to them that the children now operated and through it extracted from the composite cloud for each bird its own aura. For this was more easy than this had they essayed to operate directly upon the cloud and separate their auras to be intermingled. Now this is what's so great about reading this because there's so many clues in here. So from the paragraph above, I would surmise that each component of the aura that was extracted from each smaller bird had a unique take. And that by using each small bird, the students initiated a request to query another source to retrieve the original programming. So the small, they took each smaller bird and said, okay, get you know, you're all of your building blocks that are there in that big aura, request that back. So hence the logic for each bird would be reset and restored in good working order automatically, all using native routines that were present in each of the creatures. 
this is what's waiting for you when you traverse from one dimension to another. Only your physical body is left behind. Your spirit, your personality is intact. How you've modified yourself during your life is now part of you in the spirit realm. And the opportunities to grasp in this fantastic location are entirely up to your free will. So think about what we've just said. That that these animals in the spirit realm can be can be taken apart and put together again. If they can have that done, why can't we, right? Aren't we just logic like them? And this is also why later on in my talks and also in my book, Spirits in the Universe, in the Spirit Universe, as you can read that when you uh, like to. And you can find that on my website, nbspiritus.com. It's like when you graduate, and I've said this before, but I want to repeat it again. When you graduate from one level to another, you don't just get a piece of paper. You're given more power, more tools. You're given, it, it's, it's like you are, were a, a phone and you're given more apps on that phone. Right? Before you didn't have the ability to talk to other people. Right? Even in the, um, and now you have an app that you can message anyone in the universe. You're given more power. And that cannot happen to us as a human on Earth, right? Not now until science fiction where they can, you know, put like a chip in our brain or something. But in there, in the spirit world, you're given more power. And and, I, and, and how how we use this and how and what you need to do and what what is important to you in, in the spirit world is also revealed in another section by the spirit Arnell. Because then he talks about, you know, with this, these group of children, what do they play at, right? Because everybody, you know, all children like to play, even adults, right? Some sort of sports and so forth. So what do they, what do they play at? Now he was on the seventh level of heaven, of course, given the, the numbering system that these uh, quite a few spirits talk to the Reverend, Reverend Jeeva Owen. And as, as I said before, it's not everyone uses this. They just try to use the same concept so they could place themselves in different different levels. Like in the books um, about Chico Xavier and the whole Andre Luis, in the very first book, No Solar, you, in, in the book, he was told that his mother's on a higher level of heaven. They didn't give it any number, but he knew he knew that it was a place he could not go, right? Because as you go up higher and higher levels heaven, you need to be able to to um, get those attributes to let you exist there, right? You can always go down. You can always, if you're on level seven, you go down seven through all the way to, to the dark abyss, but you can't go up because it's just too bright. You you can't, yeah, you can't survive. Or you can survive, but you, you, it's just too uncomfortable for you. So then. So let's talk about what games were they playing. And at this school, they're from like from 8 to 18. And he described one is aerial flight, right? He described where, you know, and, and I've, you know, the, the campus was gardens and sculptures and fountains. And they're all intermixed with various halls and buildings with comprised of grounds. And outside one of the lectures hall was a garden. An enclosed area shaped into an oval by hedges and other plants. And in the middle stood a fountain circled by water. And what they would do is they would call, they would gather in this area and they, one of them would stand on top of the fountain and then he would call to one of his playmates as they were around the fountain, giving him a certain position upon the fountain. So then he had to close his eyes and raise himself and then go there by levitation and float to that position. And one after another is called that they're all grouped around the fountain. Then they have to, in their eyes closed, they have to go they have to go back to the exact spot where they stood at the beginning of the game. So if you look at that, you know, when we were young, we played a game called, you know, Marco Polo. It was played in a pool whereupon one child would hide from the others. And each child must close their eyes and yell Marco. And the other child would, with his eyes open, would have to shout Polo. Until one of the children found the one who had been constantly dodging the unseen swimmers. It was a game designed to train oneself to determine the direction in which sound came from. 
sounds like the training is about the same as Spiro, but it's more than exercise in the relationship between sound and direction. It's establishing and strengthening the mind to place the body in the exact location desired. It's about the connection between thought and action. In heaven, one may walk, but one also may arise in the atmosphere, since your mind places your body where it belongs. Terra firma is a reference point, a point to begin. Spirits who have trained themselves don't only have to travel via foot or other methods of physical transportation. They may move by thought, called volatation in spiritist literature. And the speed of light is not a, a speed limit in the spirit realm. And in the book No Solar, again, it was dictated by the spirit Andre Luis to the great Brazilian a medium, uh, Francisco C. Xavier. Andre Luis remembers a conversation he had with a friend in the spirit colony about volatation. Andre saw people walking in means of transportation named air buses, which would take people around to the colony or back to the earth plane. But he knew of people who didn't require any such means of transport. They just went. And his friend had the answer. Here in Nosolar, not all of us need an air bus for transportation because the more elevated inhabitants of the colony have the power of volatation at their disposal. Nor do all of us need communication equipment to converse over long distances because we usually maintain ourselves on a plane of perfect thought attunement. Those who are attuned in this way may use the process of mental conversation at will, regardless of the distance. So again, perfect thought attunement describes kind of one of those lessons learned in the game of aerial flight. Our now went on to describe another game. This one called balancing the ball. So I want to go through each of them, but each of these games, each of these games made people exercise one part, right? And then and in the balancing the ball, they kind of one person had a ball and two sticks, and then they had two lines of, of students, and they would mentally try to move the ball back and forth while the student walking between them with their will will power would try to keep the ball steady on the two sticks. And again, that's exercising your real power, exercising your mind, exercising your focus. So it's all these things, and it just this gives you a uh, a you know a glimpse into what's going on. Now, there's another scene of what what uh, these students practice, and that's the practice of meditation. And when we say meditation, we sit there and we we, we try to drain our mind of everything, and we, and we just kind of let ourselves be open. But it's a little bit different in the spirit world. So let's talk about that. So when spirits have been raised in the seventh level of heaven, they, you know, they reach the end years of their primary education, they are taken as a group to sit and meditate and test their ability to see, to peer into different sections of the spirit realm. Now, let me explain this a little bit. And let's, let's get into what does this mean? So this is what Arnell said. That the scene, there was a, valley where hills tree clad with shrines here and there and he he said about like 30 students and they all they all they said they all attuned themselves to each other and they reclined at ease you know be, beneath the trees and then he said to the, the gathered students he said let peace be about you and within you my children so peace and quiet right get your thoughts for those realms in which you penetrate are now realms of peace and not of unrest therein is found. So they were sitting there and the students started letting their minds explore. And then Arnell said, you, Raul, because what are you seeing? And Raul answered, upon a rock of purple stone, flat top and standing lonely, the height of 50 men, I see a figure. He is male, his robe is blue to the middle of him. And then shades into green onto amber about his knees. His belt is scarlet and white and trine. His shoulder jewel is the ruby left and right a sapphire. His chaplet is not set upon his hair quite. It hovers about his head some very little way apart. It has stars which join the scintillations and so make the chaplet consecutive, one piece circular. He goes, by these signs, he, he must be some order of high estate. Who he is and his purpose, I do not know. And I think the stationery looks... Uh, where he stands, looking abroad from the top of the rock in rapid attention, is near the beginning of the second sphere away, or the further boundary of the sphere next to us. And then the director said, okay, that's also how I see them, except 
With him, I see a child on the shoulder. Also, they look this way, but past us into the sphere between this of yours and earth. This is Israel in the Christ child role, as you saw them in the glade at Christmas tide. They were conditioned to the sphere seven and less of blind when they're appearing. So you see them now in what glory they are able to behold themselves in sphere nine, which is two spheres above. You counted the distance rightly there, but you did not see the Christ's body and clothing were more sublimated than that of Israel. And then the boy said, I saw the brightness, but I couldn't shape him. It was so bright. So what was Rival doing? He saw something two spheres above that was happening at a different time. Raul was plugging into the universal intelligence, was able to see a scene play out in a superior sphere that had already occurred some time ago. Raul was able to cor correctly detect the sphere by the more powerful light diffusing the scene which he detected. So what is that? So you can see something happen at a different level in a different at a different uh, period of time, although there is no time. Probably at a different state, right? There's no, there's no concept of time in the spirit world. So what was he doing? Let me give you another example first before we go into what all this means to us. And also, this also should give you an idea of sometimes of what mediums see who can see the future, who can, who can touch things and see pictures of objects. But let's go on. With, uh, they talked to a young, a young woman. And then she said she saw a great highway which ran along the woodside, and on the other end of the road was a river. And at one place, it ran down the tide of the river steps. And these people were crossing the river, they're crossing the, the gates, you know, the, the, the bridge. And then he saw others that went, some in the house, others in the garden. He just saw, he saw groups. And then she says, and then at the gate, there stood two men, and they were like great strength. They were like high spirits. And they looked across, and, they were now, and now and then again, one of them would just say, Lift his hands to the signal. When he did this, a beam of light crossed the bridge, and it and it rested, it rested on some of those that were coming over. And she goes, but I didn't know what it what it was. And so then Arnell explained to her. But first, um, think about what this means, right? So she's again seeing something else. And there are many instances. And then Arnell went over and touched, touched her to get a better connection. And there are many instances of the power of touch as an improved conduit of communication. When a psychic touches another incarnate or a spirit lays his or her hand on the incarnate or a spirit touches another spirit, it all seems to expand and heighten the effectiveness of the dialogue. There's a scene in the book, Missionaries of the Light, by the um, Henri Luis where Andre witnessed a spirit put his hand on an incarnate woman's head. And this is what he saw. He said, he put his hand on the young woman's forehead, keeping it under a vigorous magnetic influx while transmitting benevolent thoughts to her. I noticed that when it touched the young woman's curly hair, his per active hand let off luminous sparks, which only I could perceive. The young woman seemed to become more poised and dignified in her almost childlike expression. So it's almost like, when a spirit touches them, it's like a cable is connected directly into the body. The luminous sparks and the flashing lights that the interface was complete and operating. And while spirits can detect our thoughts from rays emanating from our brain, the level of comprehension seems to be stronger when there's physical contact. It allows a deeper intrusion to thoughts and past memories. It is as if they become merged into all the complexities within the maze of our mind, allowing the spirit to follow the path they are searching for and to expose the deeper emotion and meaning of what we do and who we are. Now, so then Arnell placed his hand on the girl, and he says, okay, let me see what you're seeing, so then I can figure this out. And he saw that, and he was saying, oh, okay, so this, he said, now he's explaining, this was actually Sphere, sphere 4. And it's the time where Sphere 3 connects to Sphere 4, and what was happening as these two sentinels on the bridge, they were looking at people who were making the journey from one sphere up to the higher sphere. And they were telling them to give them more power, right? Give them, you know, give them help as they were making the journey and help, you know, help them fulfill that journey. And if they saw any sign of weakness, they would say, okay, you know, 
shine a beam at that person and then help them, give them a, a, a ray of strength. And that's what the girl saw. So, and then and now the other thing, so that, now here's another clue. So after Arnell told these two stories, one, one saw a sphere up and one saw a sphere down, but the second one saw they, she saw a sphere superior, but it was really inferior. And this is the interesting part. After Arnell told this to the Reverend G. Bao, and he thought in his mind, why couldn't the children tell up from down, right? You'd think they would know up from down. In Arnell sensing what G. Baolin was thinking, tried to correct him misunderstanding. This is what he told the Reverend G. Baolin. This is, this is where we're getting to the point where there is no up or down, sideways, east, west, north, south. It's all data, right? I, I, I believe it's, it's all logic. And you can be anywhere you want to be by changing the, by changing the data you are associated with. So this is what he says. Only by visualizing our environment, not so materially, I perforce must tell you that I tell an earth language. And I must say now up and now down and again forward and yet again behind. But these are not adequate to enshrine the more subtle of our conditions, as you know. The perplexity of these children lay not between the two directions before, behind. For when they looked into the other spheres, they looked into an infinity or towards infinity through these spheres. You mark me, son, the operation I have described was not one bidden up and away to this sphere or that other. This with us, as with you, would be a matter of going this way or that way, forward or backward, if you so will. But what they were doing now was of a different process. It was the inverse of the other. Or instead of moving about in an environment exterior to themselves, they did the other thing. They absorbed their external and mental willful activity into the interior of themselves and found, for the time, their own environment. Their action was, you know, directed inwards upon themselves. Here, there was no such plain boundaries of realm and spheres as obtained in ordinary. It was this reversal of process which created their perplexity. They thought they had penetrated in sphere eight or nine and found their conditions which were foreign to those spheres. So it was they that blundered. So think about this for a second. There's no forward, no backward, no up, no down. This is the great conundrum of heaven for most people. And the message is from the very spirits of the Reverend Chivo, and they talk of spheres, which to our ears sound like conceding levels of concentric circles, right? The high, and which is a good way for us to look at it, right? The higher spheres encapsulating the others, like layers of an onion or tree ring. A definite ge geometric shape enables us to navigate through the many mansions of heaven. How else could the spirits speak to us, right? Telling us that in actuality, we live in a dense, information-rich environment with no time as a keeper sequence would only baffle the listener. This concept doesn't fit in our window of comprehension. That, especially, imagine imagine coming through and and you know now just some people who are um, into computer science and those type of things where they can they look at this universal cloud they they think about data being everywhere wherever you are. This is really what what they were what the children were plugging into. They were ignoring what the data was outside of them and they were plugging into a different vein. So what they're telling us is that everything, everything as in the spirit world, the physical world, the walls you live in, the pillow you lay upon your head before you sleep is a logical construct programmed by the will of high lords and their minions under the direction of God. And we're told that over and over is that everything in, you know, in the book on the way to the light, Emmanuel does our whole solar system was created by Christ and other high spirits, right? The earth was, was created by that. How? They created by their will, by their willpower. So numbers, data, tags, pointers, to other data, timestamp, ideas, or random thoughts all swirl around us. And the children of level seven were learning to tap into that data stream to selectively follow a path, to interpret the data, to relive an entire sequences of events. And gratefully, we've been created to interpret the data presented to us as concrete, as the living environment is real. Here in our physical bodies, which we are in a subjective universe, meaning that we there's things we can't do, right? We feel solid to ourselves, walls feel solid. 
We are unable in our present state to violate those rules, rules that we interpret as laws of nature. But as we ascend, the rules are removed and our sight and span of diving into an ocean of information is expanded, giving us immense capabilities of what we can only imagine. This is why we are on earth. We should expend our energies on our mind and not transitory mental, material goods. Whatever we can wish for will at some time be available to us by our mind and faith. We shall be able to create anything from the infinite universal fluid around us. Everything on earth is just part of the scenery made up so we may journey through our appointed lessons. So think about this. And in, in one of the other talks, by uh, I forgot what spirit talking to Val, he said, you have to look at this as the earth is subjective. The spirit world is objective, I'm sorry. The earth is objective, the spirit world is subjective, and then it goes to the sublime. So what does that mean? That means is that here on earth, as I said before, is that is we cannot, we cannot change through our thoughts what's around us. We are, our, our uh, spirits, our souls, get, you know, covered our physical bodies by the paraspirit, connected to the, you know, by our bodies to the paraspirit. Says, if we see a wall, it's a wall. Nothing we can do about it. Our physical body can't go through it. And if we want to change that wall to something else, we can think all we want to. It's not going to happen. When you go to the spirit world, it's subjective, meaning how your attitude changes, right? Because I've already said before, your appearance, your clothes, where you are in heaven, right? Because then the law of affinity kicks in. These people who kind of feel the same way, think the same way, same type of character, the, the natural laws of the universe created by the supreme intelligence, by God, associates people who are alike. But then the higher spirits, right? And they can start creating their own environment. And as you go higher and higher, that's why you can create. You create these things through your mind. It's subjective. And eventually, as they say, you go into this sublime state, which I have no idea what it is. But and they just and even they say they don't know what's what's going beyond a certain state. It's uh, um, interesting. So let's let's go on now. So how do how do spirits talk to each other, right? And, we, and we've already said that, you know, when um, Andre Luis, they use, you know, and his Do Solar, they use the voice. And then he talked to his friend. He said, well, you know, if we attune each other, we don't need to speak. We can talk to each other throughout whatever range we are. And in the books by Reverend G. Valwin, there's a short three paragraph description of how spirits communicate with other spirits at different levels. And this is by the spirit Zabdal, who resided on, in the 10th level of heaven. And he communicated this to the Reverend Zivao in 1913. And the, the passage lacks details, but the central theme is the need to condition oneself spiritually to speak with superior, spirits superior oneself. And Zabdal at first describes how when spirits from any level of heaven descend to the earthly plane, they must transform themselves in order to be able to make contact with incarnates. And here's how he introduces the subject communication between spirits of different levels. This is what he says. So think about this. Next time, if you're ever in a mediums meeting and these mediums are communicating and, and there's like the, the, the mentor spirit of the, of the medium of the house, think of what this poor person, this poor, you know, must do in order to condition themselves to, to even be in the same level we are. So this is what he says. When a spirit from one of these spheres descends to your earth, it is necessary in order that he may make contact with you who dwell there to, to condition himself in a like manner, and this in, in more or less degree. So it is here between the higher and lower conditions obtaining in the spheres of various quality and elevation. What does that mean? It means that the necessity of spirits making themselves denser to be able to be seen by inferior spirits is, is, amp, is also is necessary. It's also amply documented in the series of books psychographed by Francisco C. Xavier under the influence of, of um, the spirit of Andre Louise. And in fact, so again, what I'm telling you is these books by Reverend G. Valen, which, which I have put in here, is what, what, they're, what they're saying, and this is in the Spirits and Spirit Universe book two, is 
what we're getting from this book is, is a lot more information than we had of what we're being told from the books by Chico in certain areas, right? It's complimentary. And that's why it's, it's so interesting that here we have uh, English Anglican uh, uh, reverend in the 1910s and 20s and 30s communicating the spirits and everything he had was, was corresponding and giving us more information from the spirit world. And in actuality, he was a spiritist medium. So anyway, so so we've heard that too. In in Henri Luis, when he said he journeyed to the to the abyss, also known you know kind of a purgatory type region below the crust of the earth, he was instructed to concentrate and increase the material component of his body so he may be detected by the low spirits living in the dark regions. So hence, for example, when a spirit in the tenth level travels downward to the seventh level, they must take on the characteristics of a spirit living on that stage of heaven. They must decrease their brightness and take on more matter, since residents below them have a higher ratio of matter to energy than spirits on a superior plane. Again, this kind of goes with the whole thing. Is every time you graduate from level one level to the next, you kind of lose some of that matter, and you get more and more energy. You get more power, more pure universal fluid, maybe. I don't know. So then... Zabdal exposed the fact that all spirits on a certain level are not equal in the ease of communication, including humans on earth. This is what he tells us. But it is easier for us to communicate with some of you than with others, and that according to your degree of advancement spiritually. So again, it is here in the spirit land. There are those in the third sphere who know of the presence of those of the fourth or fifth or even higher spheres by reason of their advancement spiritual, spiritually beyond their fellows. If to these latter such visitors wish to become visible and audible, they must the more completely condition themselves to the environment of that sphere, and this they do. So, Zabdal's statements, let's just peer into what is required for us to advance. Not only do we need to encompass the path of light to create a foundation of love, charity, fraternity for all of God's creatures, but we must acquire capabilities which are important to spirits in higher spheres. There is an entire organization of schools and paths to higher universities within each level of heaven. So hence, each spirit whose desires advancements are required to improve their spirituality as well as their acquired knowledge. Both are prerequisites in order to be promoted to a higher level. So that now leads us to this observation of what he had just presented. This description is an outline. And you will see that what seems at first to complicate life here really serves to its orderly arrangement. The leading principles which govern the communion of saints on earth with those past higher are produced hither and continued on in higher places, upward in orderly sequence. And if you wish to know what regulates our own communion with those above us, then reason it out by analogy, and you'll have a fair knowledge of it, as is possible to you while still on earth incarnate. So what does that mean? The spirit realm is contiguous and symmetrical, like the rings of a tree or the marvelous structure of the chambers of a seashell. One sphere melds into another, all connected. How each of these communication flows down follows the same pattern up. Spirits who wish to speak with higher spirits must possess the correct qualifications to open a channel through the boundaries from one level to the next. The attributes are always the same. Only the degree for each level and the variances between them differ. Spirituality is the key to talk. Some of the systems request favors and learn from those who have superior knowledge. So for us on earth, as we increase our knowledge, and improve our dedication, more roads will be open for us to receive messages and assistance from our spirit mentors. While it may take time to understand what is being said to us, the meaning will become clear with more study and closer observation. So I hope this has given everyone kind of a something to think about. Because what, what do we usually think about heaven, right? We you know, is you die, you become a spirit. And, and of course, spirit just says we are who we are. We just kind of lose our physical body and our spirit body. And as I think most spirits just say, yeah, and we, we look the way we want to look. If we were 80 at the time we died, we'll, we'll look, you know, maybe we like ourselves at 30. We'll look like we were at 30. You know, I'll have more hair and less fat and all that, right? But we still think ourselves then as looking like a um, uh something physical and we may be lighter, something that is more ethereal, but would still, we still think ourselves as this encapsulated into some sort of a, a, a physical body. And in actuality, 
it may look like the way because that's how you want to appear to other people. And that, and that's kind of the, the, the custom I would think in, in probably in these lower levels of heaven, but in actuality, you really are this ball of logic. And as this ball of logic, depending on your knowledge and your spirituality, you access more of the of the universal cloud you access more and the more you understand the universe the spirit universe the more you can go from one place to another as as the speed of thought and the more you can call upon you can call upon um wherever you want to be now think and let me give you an example you've people have all heard stories of near-death experiences and in most of these near-death experiences, people go and then they have they have a life review. And that life review isn't just like a motion picture. You're actually put into the middle of things. And then and people report that they not only do they hear their thoughts at the time, but they hear other people's thoughts. It's like they are just inside the picture. And in fact, this whole thing was also talking about uh, in the book, Members of a Suicide, uh, um, by the uh, the great Brazilian medium Yvonne Pierre, which you can also get on the, um, on the, on the, on the uh, EDICI bookstore or on Amazon. It's a great book. And he, he was uh, Camino Blanco, who was the, the person in this one. They were, they were shown uh, these other people commit suicide and they're showing, okay, why did they commit suicide? What was their past life? Why did they have the problems they did have? And they were put, put right in the middle of everything. Now think about that. Think about what that means. That means that all data is there at any point in time. And that all they, so if you, if they were doing your life review, they didn't have to go, okay, we, we need to take all this film we have because we've been filming this person for, you know, the next, the last 50 years before they, they came back to earth. And we got to like edit all this stuff. Not, that's not, you know, that's not how it's done. At least I don't think it's done. Is that all that data is there to say, okay, we'll take this person. And we'll say, you know, John Doe, and said, and then let's get to the data and let's see, you know, and let's quickly find out, you know, what he did on November the 4th at five o'clock, because this was a, a, you know, very important factor in his life. And they just take all the data, not only for this one person, but everyone around him, and they replay it. That's, that's the complexity of heaven. That's the complexity of what's awaiting people who will humble themselves and who will take the time to get themselves ready to go to that level of heaven. And what does it take? It takes intellectual and emotional, spiritual, and it's hard work, right? Because to have that power, imagine, you know, imagine someone who's not trained. They wouldn't know what to do. That's why there's so many spirits on the lower, in the lower zone, the umbrella, the Portuguese, or the dark abyss. And they, you know, they, they don't know how important it is for them to learn and be humble and learn. And, and, and I understand, right? Because we've all, I'm sure we've all been there. I know I must have thinking, I'm not going to follow orders. I'm not going to do what they tell me to. But if you just let yourself understand what, what that means is that, there has to be this discipline. There has to be, this has to be this filter. This is why the, the doors of heaven are narrow. The doors of heaven, Jesus never said, oh, the doors of heaven are wide. Anybody can come in. No, Christ said the doors of heaven are narrow. The doors of heaven are narrow because there's so much on the other side. And you wouldn't want an airline pilot flying a plane who never was in a simulator, didn't have any discipline. No, you, you have to prove yourself to have that discipline to get into heaven. And once you're there, you're just going to be trained over and over, more and more and more. And you, and then free will here on the plan of atonement, our free will is very limited free will. We have mostly the, the free will to make good or bad choices, right? We're usually given the trials that we'll experience to us, even in the spirit world. Like that's, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're given, this is your environment you're going to be in, you know, Take your time, learn your lesson. 
But as you go higher and higher, you become more of an independent person. You be, you have more of your free will, what you want to do, how you want to be part of the teams you want to be part of the team of, of what they're doing, right? What interests you? So, but it just takes, it takes dedication and study. And therefore, read the Spirit's book, Alan Kardec, read all his books, the, the, uh, the Gospel According to Spiritism, um, the Book of, of Mediumship, Genesis, Heaven and Hell. You know, read whatever you can, the books by Chico Xavier. And, and what I've done on my site, nwspiritism.com, it's right here on the on the bottom there, is I've tried to create, I've tried to take all these things and put them into more digestible uh presentations right because a lot of the books you see they, they talk about many subjects right they go from subject to subject to subject and so what i've done like on the case for reincarnation is trying to get everything i've seen about reincarnation put it in the case for reincarnation explore your destiny is okay what how are we led by the spirit world how is heaven and you know how is their environment i put that in explore your destiny um the seven tenets of spiritism i talk about my own self of how you see the signs and signals of what's going on the problem is the solution. I talk about the trials you go through and those trials, and they're not punishments. They're actually classes for you to improve yourself. And the more, and when you see that in, you know, like in the problem is the solution and you see that these are classes for to improve ourselves, you understand what you need to take out of that. And then the other one is that my, my whole air, uh, trilogy of books from, you know, from Reverend G. Val Owen, which I go through many, many different areas. And this is one is Heaven and Below is, is book one. Spirits and the Spirit Universe is book two. And then how we are guided by spirits. So it's, it's all telling you, it's all telling you what is happening around us to give you. It's all about giving you an idea of how you should look at your life. And the more you look at spiritism and understand spiritism, and you understand why you're here on earth, the more relaxed you are. Because you understand when this, you know, oh my heaven, you know, when this terrible thing just happened and oh, it just, just really upset me, it's like, okay, you be, you're less upset because you understand, okay, there's a reason for that. What's the reason? What am I supposed to learn from that? I guess I'm supposed to learn to be more calm, you know, more, maybe more loving, whatever. There's, there's lots of, of different different things you should learn. But it's so there's no sense of ever punishing us by God, by Christ, by the spirits, by the higher spirits. It's a sense of what is going to be edifying. What it's everything is going to be for our edification. So I hope I uh, gave you something to think about during this period. I uh, um, so please send me your any questions. Please also go to my website, nwspiritism.com. If you want, if you'd like to, and tell your friends, uh, share, you know, when I share this, share this video, tell them about uh, Kardec Radio on their uh, Android or their Apple device. They just go in the app store and put in Kardec Radio. They can listen to Kardec Radio 24 hours a day. They can go on the Kardec Radio Facebook page. They can go on the Kardec Radio um, uh internet page right just go on the on your laptop and you can you can listen to any program you'd like to on demand you can search for those you can also go to my youtube channel nw spiritism you can see these i can i'm making other other videos and so and please you know share these things and spread these around and i will now go to the uh in and I just want to bless everyone. Thank you everyone for listening to me. And I just want to say everyone have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. And remember, I am on every Sunday at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, all the other time zones around. If you have questions, put them in the comment section. I love it when people ask me questions. I don't mind going off, off topic. And we will see you next week at this time i would like to thank everyone for listening to our program on cardoc radio and to point you in the direction to find more information about the spirit world around us you can visit my blog at www.nwspiritism.com and that is www.nws northwest spiritism.com and 
If you are ever in the Northwest, I certainly would welcome to have you come to our meeting on Cambridge Island near Seattle in the state of Washington. Many blessings to all of you, and please continue to explore spiritism and the spirit world around us.